Welcome back to the Green Swan Conference. My name is Fred Samama. I'm Chief Responsible Investment Officer at CPR Amundi Group. I'm also one of the co-authors of the Green Swan book and a member of the Conference Management Committee uh, for this uh, event. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Sylvie Goura, our first keynote speaker of the day and a co-organizer of the conference. Sylvie has dedicated her life to public service, holding Europe dear in her heart. She is the current deputy governor of the Banque de France since 2018. And prior to this, she was a member of the EU parliament and she served as a political advisor to Romano Prodi during his time as president of the EU Commission. Interestingly, recently, she elaborated on the links between climate change and the COVID-19 and the need to rethink world governance, market failures, and sustainable activities. And she approaches this complex problem holistically under the banner One Health. Moreover, she has a deep passion for concrete solutions with real impacts and therefore when President Macron created the One Planet Finance Lab to develop concrete solutions on climate change, she was naturally a driving force. Sylvie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Frédéric. First of all, uh, I want to say a great thank to all the organizers uh, and to Luis Savazu Pereira da Silva from the BIS. I think you are in Basel with him, uh, Frédéric because he was the soul of our team. And The Green Swan is actually a book uh, I, I show right now. Uh, you are one of the authors. The other ones are Patrick Bolton, Morgan Desprez, and Romain Svartman from uh, the Banque de France. And Frédéric, you, you have mentioned it before. So the, the book was published in January 2020 at a time where uh, we lived in a pre-COVID world. And um, I read the book again uh, in the last days. Uh, you were warning about severe risk deriving from climate change and, I quote, over human caused environmental degradation, such as a loss of biodiversity. The title of the book plays with the concept of uh, Nicola uh, Nassim Taleb, the black swans, these events uh, touching upon the financial sector that are unexpected of a large magnitude and can only be uh, explained afterward. And all your reflection is to see the analogies and the differences with the black swans. Uh, as far as climate is concerned, it is quite certain that uh, severe events will occur, even if we don't know when, now, uh, how and where. They could even be worse than the ones caused by, caused by black swans because climate change and many of its impacts are largely irreversible. And no one, uh, no household firm, but even no government can hedge uh, from this risk on her or his own, which requires an unprecedented level of cooperation. And this is the reason why this conference is particularly important because it shows the, the global mobilization. Meanwhile, so since the publication in January 2020, the world faced the COVID-19 health crisis, a crisis due to lack of health prevention, unpreparedness at national levels and flows in international cooperation, a crisis which obliged governments to lock down hundreds of millions of people and stop or reduce economic activity, a crisis with huge macroeconomic costs, um, with large budgetary and monetary supports coming from governments and central bank. So on the cli climate and environment, scientists and the authors of the Green Swine try to warn us on what could happen if we don't act. And on the health front, we experience skin in the game one an ex what an ex unexpected vital global crisis can be uh, if we, because we did not uh, act or anticipate. Of course, now we, we feel a certain relief thanks to vaccinations, at least in developed economies. But there is no vaccine against climate change and environmental risk. And that's the reason why this very tangible experience makes the Green Swan even more interesting to read and meditate upon now than when it was published. 
when we began at the at the end of the summer last year to think about this conference at the modest uh, deputy level, we uh, we were very motivated. But we were by far not sure to attract such a prestigious, prestigious round of speakers. It was before the new momentum in the US. It was before the launch of the very ambitious uh, Italian 20, uh, G20 presidency and the UK G7 presidency. Both are very committed to climate. So. It is fascinating to see that the analysis of the green swan is still valid and that the context changed dramatically. Um, there is more appetite for multilateral cooperation, which is good news. The private sector is also taking commitments to net zero before the COP26. And uh, we can now uh, look at the future, asking ourselves some questions that arise nevertheless. The first one is, should we focus on climate or broaden the scope? The second I would like to tackle with you is how can we make sure that public policies are coherent and coordinated? And a more philosophical one is it how to thrive within limits. On, on beyond climate, I, I read again the charter of the NGFS adopted in December 2017. Yesterday we had uh, the plaidoyer of uh, the governor of the Banque de France and Frank Elderson on for the NGFS. They stated that this charter states that the, the aim of the network is in particular to contribute to the development of environment and climate risk management. So the, the scope is quite broad uh, and it is key to consider how ecological crises are in fact multiple and interconnected. The 2019 UN Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, for example, reminds us that human activity caused a catastrophic decline in earth biodiversities uh, with a very rapid rate of extinction of species. More recently, the Das Gupta Review in the UK uh, states how severe the risk linked to biodiversity loss are and how complex the interactions between human action and nature is. There are many, many examples. I'm not going to, to quote all the, the reports. And uh, one of the bridges may be the One Health approach, and I don't resist to quote the Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Draghi, in his, his final declaration of the Global Health Summit in Rome uh, on May 21st. I know uh, that Mario Monti was part of it. I quote Mario Draghi, the Rome Declaration adopted this day, rightly emphasized the importance of pursuing a One Health approach. And here I'm coming to climate, says Draghi, to preserve human, animal, and environmental safety. This is the key priority of Italy's 20, G20 presidency. The scientific expert panel of the G20 has stated how most infectious diseases are caused by pathogens that are derived from animals. Their emergence is largely driven by deforestation, wildlife exploitation, and other human activities. Effective environmental action can help to defend animal welfare and ultimately mitigate the risk of new health threats. When pursuing a common strategy to prevent future pandemics, we must uphold our commitment to limit environmental damage and tackle the climate crisis, etc. So you can read the, the, the full declaration of uh, Mario Draghi, and I'm sure that on health aspects, Mario Monti, uh, chair of the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development launched by the WHO Europe, uh, which made several proposals in March already, will further develop when it takes the floor. So it's, we have this warning, we have some reports coming from the Dutch Central Bank when Frank Alderson was there on biodiversity. We have the One Planet Summit organized by the President Macron in, in January. And very soon, a new task force for nature-related financial disclosures will be launched to deal with biodiversity-related financial risk. So all in all, we see that there is an awareness on climate. The pandemics had bro has brought new topics at the top of the agenda. And of course, it's difficult to choose. I, I don't resist to, see, to quote Larry Summer, who recently stated, I quote, the central banking community has to date been roughly 50 to 100 times more focused on issues of climate change than issues of pandemic finance on, on readiness to deal with the next pandemics when it comes. Uh, that's the reason why, in my opinion, all these issues are not different chapters of a book we could read one after the others, but more alerts popping up on our screens uh, simultaneously and we have to face. 
Uh, and that's the reason why coordination and coherence of public policies matter. So I come to my second point. I will be brief because the green swan is exactly uh, the, the, the work in the NGFS and this mobilization shows that uh, it is clear that treasuries, central bank, have to work with, with, uh, with private finance and many actors. It was already mentioned uh, in the green swan when one of the top topics for all of us, it was mentioned yesterday by Mark Carney, is of course disclosure and the fact that we should not only improve and enhance cooperation within the official sector between governments and central banks, each of us within our mandate, but also looking at what the private uh, innovation is bringing. My last point is, is a more ph philosophical one. It's on the boundaries. Uh, some scientists, in particular Johan Hockström and his colleagues, have developed the concept of planetary boundaries and applied it to nine Earth system processes, including climate and biodiversity related processes that are vital to life on Earth. Um, well, abundance is not exactly what we have always been thinking it is. The task of our generation is to invent a new model to live and live well, of course, within these boundaries or within ecological limits. Nick Stern wrote a fantastic paper for the IMF recently on should we focus on capital or on flows? It is clear that um, until now we have more uh, focused on the GDP, on GDPs as, uh, as in, in a classical sense and that we will have to move to more uh, future-oriented uh, definitions of GDP. The, the Das Gupta review argues that there is a tension between economic growth and ecological goals. The only comment I will do is that we should avoid the two pitfalls that it is to say, well, on the one hand, we would be doomed uh, to give up uh, all we want to do. It is not true. We are sure that we can provide new solutions. On the other hand, the, the second pitfall is that technological innovations as such can help, but requires that uh, human being learn again what frugality means, as the Pope would, would say. You are in Rome, so I can I can quote the, the Franciscus and encyclic uh, uh, Laudato Si, or to take the words of Professor Dasgupta, some self-restraint in our consumption of, of goods. Uh, it is a question for central banks because, of course, it is having an impact on output, it is having an impact on financial stability. Yesterday, the point of transition was discussed uh, in several uh, panels and, and keynote speeches. Um, and we should not uh, oppose uh, techno utopians to techno pessimists, but really calculate what the impact of the change we want ourselves to see happening is going to be. And of course, it requires a very personal commitment from all of us after centuries of development during which human beings did not care so much about the limits of earth and resources. Um, in ancient mythology, uh, Prometheus, who stole the fire to the gods, which means encouraged energy consumption, is severely punished for eternity. And of course, we don't envisage such a punishment, but we should be aware that um, huge challenges are in front of us, which is the message. I go back to the green swan and I recommend to read it. You can download it to the site on the website on the BIS or the Banque de France. So I, I conclude here. I would like to pass the floor, to give the floor to Mario Monti. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone needs to introduce, uh, Mario Monti is so well known that I don't, he does not need so much introduction, maybe very rapidly. You are at your office at the Senate in Italy because you are a uh, member of the Italian Senate in the life of uh, long sen senators, which is a very great honor in Italy. You are still the president of the Bocconi University in Milan. You were a member of the European Commission twice on market and competition. You were the prime minister of Italy between 2011 and 2013. And now you take the floor with the uh, the hat you prefer, but also the one of uh, chair of the WHO Europe Pan-European uh, Commission on Health and, and Sustainable Development. Mario, we are very glad to have you with us and I give you the floor immediately. Thank you so much for being with us. 
Madame Goulart for that uh, generous introduction, which, uh, however, due to your modesty, omits uh, what is the greatest uh, claim to fame for me, namely to have co-authored a book uh, with you on democracy in Europe. Uh, it is an honor to take part in this really unique conference. And I'm very grateful to the BIS, the Banque de France, the IMF, and the NGFS. Before I begin my remarks, I must uh, declare not uh, a conflict of interest, but rather a complementarity of perspectives. Why? Well, among uh, those invited to deliver special guest uh, speeches at this conference, I'm certainly the one who is uh, the most uh, peripheral, if not extraneous, to the core of this conference, both in terms of uh, thematic uh, competence and in terms of uh, uh, institutional positioning in the system. I'm not uh, unluckily uh, for me, one of you, key members and leaders of the financial system. Maybe this, however, allows me to have uh, a more detached perspective. And with this vantage point, I would like to say that I am genuinely very, very impressed by what uh, you all, the organizing uh, entities and the community working uh, globally now on linking climate change and financial system have been uh, achieving and bringing it uh, so deeply into the uh, operational aspects. So these are my, th this is a genuine admiration that I wanted to express. Now, Coming from the outside, um, so much outside that I have to confess that uh, when uh, in 2015, Mark Carney delivered his uh, visionary uh, statement, uh, I did not read it immediately. It did not hit me immediately. However, I've now been able to see to uh, to what extent it really was seminal and visionary. Now, uh, why do I speak of a complementarity of perspectives? Because uh, I have two points of attack to the topic of these days uh, in my uh, older or more recent uh, uh, activity. Uh, well, I've been uh, for a long time uh, a student of uh, the financial environment in the sense of regulation, supervision, monetary policy. And I was even commissioner for financial services in Brussels. And now more recently, as uh, kindly was referred to by Sylvie, I've been asked uh, to chair a, uh, a commission, a pan-European commission on health and sustainable development. So let me say a couple of things coming from these two points from where I come. The financial environment, I know that, uh, and it would be surprising uh, uh, if the opposite were true, I know that there are uh, a variety of degrees of enthusiasm among the community of central bankers and supervisors on uh, whether, how, and to what, ex uh, to what extent uh, they are uh, already extremely hard to pursue mandate should be enriched, complicated, made more human, made more problematic, by taking responsibility to direct the instrument that they have, that you have in your hands towards uh, the climate change issues. Well, 
if I were in their position, I would uh, not hesitate so much. And I know that most of them, most of you do not hesitate. Um, I remember at least uh, a couple of instances over the years in which those responsible for the financial environment um, did uh, operate uh, doing uh, maybe inadvertently something which uh, would uh, have put uh, if seen uh, transparently uh, and clearly I believe uh, greater systemic uh, problems than are maybe entailed today in uh, uh, taking care of climate change. Why? Well, the two cases I have in mind uh, are one uh, which I studied particularly in the 80s for Italy, but it did apply at that time uh, to many, many countries. The, uh, the financial repression of the credit and financial system that was uh, put in place uh, by, by parliaments, by governments, uh, but also with the uh, active involvement of uh, central banks uh, and uh, supervisory authorities. Um, it uh, could be shown, it was shown, that uh, the probably unintended collateral side effect of uh, all the battery of constraints uh, on the financial behavior of uh, individuals, households, companies, uh, banks, and other financial intermediaries, the side effect of that was a massive subsidy given to national governments in the form of uh, greater uh, ease in uh, uh, placing uh, growing amounts uh, of public debt and uh, at lower interest rates that uh, a less constrained market would have implied. So that was a phase uh, uh, in which uh, uh, there was uh, some uh, uh, slightly uh, schizophrenic uh, attitude, uh, objectively speaking, between monetary authorities which uh, uh, rightly and permanently were uh, uh, urging governments and parliaments to contain the public sector deficit uh, so as to contain the obnoxious phenomenon of the crowding out of private investment uh, conducive to growth and to finance all too easy um, current, not just uh, uh, government deficits, but current government deficits, which uh, were certainly not leading to growth. Uh, and. Uh, uh, on one hand, there was this uh, strong advocacy for a more orthodox uh, behavior in terms of public finance. But on the other hand, there was uh, day after day a de facto accommodation that was the term used uh, through uh, constraints placed upon other entities, other actors, the beneficiary of which was the public uh, government. The, the government, which uh, may may not uh, be necessarily a bad thing, but uh, I was convinced at that time and learned over the years in different positions that uh, there was uh, a, a dangerous spillover onto the political systems, and because uh, those uh, deciding the size of the deficit in government and in parliament, so the political cost of doing that somewhat reduced, sometimes sharply reduced, by the 
uh, elimination of the financial attrition at the moment of financing uh, the huge uh, uh, deficit and debt. Well, uh, a more recent uh, instance, this is more uh, debatable, there are not yet historical judgments pronounced, um, and this is uh, a matter for uh, current uh, analysis and reviews by many central banks in the world, not only in Europe. The uh, very lengthy at this point uh, phase of uh, huge monetary accommodation, uh, which uh, more or less uh, following uh, 2015 uh, came about in most uh, um, uh, countries or systems of countries, uh, QE or with other um, uh, labels. That uh, too, in my view, uh, will have had certainly some beneficial effects uh, in terms of the economy, but through a different mechanism has uh, certainly reduce the incentive for political systems in those countries which still needed their public finances to be contained, reduce the incentives to, to do so. Then came the pandemic and uh, created uh, special circumstances. So I mentioned these two historical precedents uh, to indicate uh, that uh, in, uh, in my view, it is, uh, it is less uh, extraneous to the philosophy and the mandate and uh, uh, to the spirit of central banking and financial supervision to, to do what uh, you are now doing more and more um, uh, uh, forcefully and with uh, uh, more sophisticated instruments to use the financial uh, environment so as to uh, try to uh, reduce uh, the threat of climate change then was uh, um, putting in practice a monetary or a regulatory policy which uh, in fact uh, was uh, facilitating uh, an objective more uh, facilitating a, um, uh, sorry uh, was making more difficult an objective closer to the concerns of central bankers and financial supervisors that is public finance uh, than climate change um, is uh, now let me abandon the perspective uh, which uh, I am sure uh, also for the um, simplification with which I had to deliver it uh, on this occasion will have generated some uh, um, eyebrows raising. And let me turn to health. And here I would like to second uh, the suggestion uh, given by Sylvie in her opening remarks that uh, climate change and uh, health uh, are really very, very intimately linked. Uh, it would not be for me to provide uh, uh, scientific evidence. Uh, you are all familiar with uh, uh, the, the link uh, climate change, uh, uh, reduction of biodiversity, um, health, uh, pandemics, etc. And uh, uh, and so uh, I think it is really fascinating to uh, try and examine both by analogy and uh, because of uh, uh, possible synergies <coughs> what the financial system <coughs> does in terms of uh, um, fight to climate change and what it uh, begins to do, might do more forcefully <clears throat> in order to take care uh, also of uh, the different aspect within the One Health, uh, which is uh, human health. Uh, as was mentioned already by Sylvie, 
uh, One Health uh, is uh, defined uh, <coughs> as uh, a, a vision of uh, health which embraces the health of humans, the health of animals, the health of the planet. Uh, <coughs> it is uh, <coughs> extremely difficult to be confident that uh, <coughs> interventions, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, human health uh, may <coughs> even include the uh, weaknesses of voice at a certain moment. Um, the, uh, it is very difficult to make sure that uh, uh, public policies uh, fight uh, in favor of human health uh, globally unless they put the fight in the context of uh, the uh, One Health uh, approach. And here, <clears throat> again, um, Sylvie is uh, proving to be a, a driving force. So this tends to happen uh, to her uh, wherever she does uh, work in the Pan-European uh, Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, uh, which I coordinate. <clears throat> and there we have formulated already a number of proposals, uh, which I will not review now in full, but which uh, draw inspiration, uh, you may wish to be aware of this, from the work that you are all conducting, particularly the NGFS, and uh, <clears throat> we will articulate uh, better in our final report to be delivered by September, what uh, changes could be introduced uh, in the financial systems to make them uh, uh, more conducive to a strong contribution to uh, uh, a better global health. But here I would like to use my few remaining uh, minutes to dwell on uh, one of our proposals, which has already been formulated uh, in, in a call to action, a document that we published in, uh, in mid-March, um, where we uh, deal with uh, how to create uh, an appropriate proximity and familiarity between those who uh, work on health and those who work on uh, finance. Um, the, uh, what we presented in particular on the occasion to which Sylvie alluded the, the Global Health Summit uh, in, uh, in Rome in June, uh, was, uh, was the following uh, consideration. The, the Global Health Summit uh, was uh, a, a, great, uh, a great opportunity at the initiative <coughs> of the Italian presidency of the G20 and of the president of the European Commission to move forward the agenda for uh, better governance of global health. <coughs> uh, the, the, the point uh, that uh, from our perspective, by the way, as you might imagine, uh, if I have been asked uh, by the WHO uh, Europe uh, to share this commission on uh, uh, health uh, and sustainable development, uh, it is not uh, a commission of scientists uh, or of health experts. We also have them on our commission and very, and very uh, remarkable ones but it's a commission which is composed also of uh, economists, uh, of uh, uh, former heads of governments uh, or heads of states. Um, there is uh, uh, more than one person who has uh, 
like Sylvie or has had experience with central banks. And our mandate is really to uh, provide the suggestions on how to reconsider policy priorities in the light of the pandemic. So how to uh, re-engineer the interfaces between health policies, uh, finance policies, uh, um, market policies, foreign policies, and so on and so forth. So we devote therefore particular attention to the to the interface between health policy and financial policy in a broad sense and therefore we are very interested in drawing lessons from the uh, segment of the one health which is more advanced uh, thanks to you all uh, in uh, uh, developing this interaction with uh, finance, which is climate change. We try to do the same in a complementary way for the interface between uh, health and finance. Now, uh, we uh, have been very much inspired by the experience uh, that uh, at the G20 was done uh, more or less uh, uh, 10 years ago, a bit more, with the setting up of the Financial Stability Board. Uh, what happened at that time, you know this much better than I do, uh, a, uh, a fundamental public good, key for our societies and for our economies, was disrupted that public good was financial stability. Quite promptly and forcefully, the G20 set in motion the Financial Stability Board, first chaired by Mario Draghi, then by Mark Carney, and then by uh, others who are working very well on it. And uh, from that uh, high level uh, political uh, piloting came as a series of principles which have been inspiring uh, uh, legislations, uh, uh, reconsiderations of supervisory policies, etc. in uh, many, many jurisdictions. And that clearly helped uh, avoid, uh, at least for now, but I'm more confident than that, the repetition of a, such a calamitous uh, financial crisis. Now, what happened with the pandemic? Another fundamental public good, but we normally recognize uh, the fundamentality and the nature of public goods to fundamental public goods only when they break down. The pandemic has been a breakdown in another fundamental public good, that is public health. Uh, of course, a, a whole series of uh, responses are in the process or have been given or are in the process of being given by WHO and many, many other institutions in a very forceful and rather well-coordinated manner. But uh, we uh, should ask the question, uh, why, uh, I mean, uh, how could we uh, recreate some of the conditions that uh, uh, worked uh, so well in the case of the other public good, financial uh, stability, which had turned into financial instability. Well, uh, our idea, which uh, I'm glad to say seems to be gaining uh, ground in different contexts, uh, the G20, but also the G7 and uh, various uh, circles, is that, uh, of course, the WHO, a strengthened WHO, better finance, made more independent, uh, given the instrument to be uh, more uh, able to call countries to transparency and to implementation of, of what the WHO uh, says, 
should uh, be more than ever at the center of the system. But uh, uh, it would be advantageous to those uh, um, caring about health, uh, from individual health ministers to the WHO itself, to have a more permanent familiarity and proximity with the, the finance ministers, with the central banks, uh, with supervisors, and with heads of government. I remember my experience as uh, one of those, as uh, prime minister in Italy, during the financial crisis uh, itself. And uh, at that time, but also subsequently, the position of a health minister in the Council of Ministers is not a central position. We need to make uh, health policy a topic which must be uh, at uh, in a very high position in the uh, agenda of uh, finance ministers as well, not only health ministers, and heads of governments. This uh, seems to be very easy now. They already are doing this. They spend much of their time, even the heads of governments, on this part of their agenda. But let's hope that the pandemic is not here to stay too long. What happens if in one year or so other, uh, let's hope not catastrophic events, attract the attention of heads of governments even more than the pandemic now? The momentum which is there now would be lost. Uh, uh, the very much that remains to be done to put our health systems in a better shape so that there aren't so devastating uh, pandemics or other global health crises in the future will require a prolonged high level attention, not just for one year. So our idea is that uh, a global health board should be created at the G20, uh, composed uh, um, in, a, in a way which would see a fundamental role there for the WHO, for the other international organizations which deal with uh, health, but also with those which deal with finance. So the proximity of health uh, filiere and uh, finance filiere. And uh, why not? Probably central banks as well. This uh, would uh, then provide a high level uh, political impulsion uh, to the world of health without any prejudice, on the contrary, to the more uh, institutionalized and more universalistic entities like the WHO. Uh, for example, it has been proposed by an independent panel that uh, the UN should set up uh, an, uh, uh, a, a global health threats uh, council at the UN, elected by all member states, etc. Perfect, perfect. But uh, where would one draw the political impulsion and the continuity of attention? We believe that uh, uh, even for the WHO and the world of health, it would be very advantageous to try to have this continuous proximity with the world of finance and maybe extrapolating our uh, remarks, our reflections of today into the longer term future, because financial stability, because public health are two fundamental public goods, global public goods, but they are not the only ones and certainly uh, <laughs> climate uh, and the environment is a fundamental one, why not 
one day one could conceive at the G20 of a global One Health board, which would give permanently more proximity and familiarity to finance, climate change, health, and uh, would be there a personality, I have concluded, a personality uh, wide ranging enough and imaginative enough to be able to chair such a body. I believe so. And uh, one such personality has taken the floor uh, at this conference uh, uh, already, I believe, yesterday. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Monti, and many thanks uh, to Sylvia as well, and uh, especially to, uh, to First Earth uh, think out of the box and to, the next, uh, to move to the next uh, frontier. It's now time for the three panels, uh, G, H, and I, that are now starting in parallel. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you.